I wonder if this sounds familiar to you. You get home from a tough day at work. You probably should have done the washing up last night. You sit down for a second and it's almost like the sofa engulfs you. Okay, fine, I'll order in for tonight, but none for the rest of the month, I promise. Uh -oh. You just lied to yourself, like millions of people do daily. What if I told you what seemed like free choice was anything but? What if I told you that whilst we were in lockdowns in a global pandemic, food delivery apps were working hard to hack your brain? And not only that, they were trying to find ways to change your behavior forever. My name is Carlin, I'm a family doctor from London, and I wanna share with you secrets of what is driving the obesity rates in society at the moment. And if you have these apps on your phone, I'm gonna tell you something that will surprise you, but... Why should I care? Well, it has something to do with this. Obesity costs this country about $150 billion a year, or almost 10% of the national medical budget. It costs hundreds of billions of dollars each year and leads to deadly chronic diseases. Who's to blame for the United States' obesity epidemic? Approximately one in three adults and one in six children are obese. The World Health Organization says the number of obese children and teens is now 10 times higher than it was 40 years ago. The latest WHO report on the obesity epidemic shows that no European country is on track to slow it down by 2025. In the UK, 60% of adults are either overweight or obese and up to a third of children. And the problem with obesity is it's such a complicated condition. It increases your risk of multiple cancers, heart disease, strokes and diabetes. And not to mention, it's a huge burden on a country's healthcare system. In the UK, the NHS spends up to £6 billion a year on obesity-related issues. And it's no mystery that in the West, a sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise, poor diet and social inequality has shot up rates of obesity. And then came along the COVID pandemic. A SARS-like virus, which has infected hundreds in China, has now reached the United States. 2020 is now the deadliest year in U.S. history. Down this road here, these are the 12 towns which are on lockdown. We've the World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19. We spent more time indoors, on our computers, on our TVs, on our phones, less time exercising and more of a strain on our mental health. From the barrage of apocalyptic news headlines to war breaking out, at the same time, while we were spending more time indoors, a new industrial complex was beginning to boom. This was the rise of the food delivery apps. Uber Eats. Quarter pounder with cheese. Mayo chicken. Sweet chili chicken wrap. In the first six months of 2020, Deliveroo had 74 million orders. This then jumped to 149 million orders by the same time next year. Just Eat had doubled their orders in the same period of time and Uber Eats saw a 150% surge in their orders. The world food delivery app industry is thought to hit a $300 billion valuation by 2027. Their use has exploded and absolutely mesmerized us. Up to 70% of UK adults have one of these apps on their phone. And these companies have managed to do this in an intriguing way. Let me explain. Every magic trick consists of three parts or acts. The very first act is the pledge. You take something ordinary, like your favorite fast food, McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, whatever you love, the thing that has that cherished sentimental value to you, and something with childhood memories, something that makes you feel good inside. The second act is called the turn. The magician takes the ordinary and they do something extraordinary. In this case, they take your favorite food and they make it arrive at your doorstep within minutes. They do this by using algorithms and AI, complex calculations about which driver should go where, working out supply and demand, all of this seamlessly on an app on your phone. For a real magic trick, you need something more, something surprising. To really hook someone in, you need to do something special. And so, every magic trick has a third act. And usually it's to bring something back, something that you've made disappear. But for these food delivery apps, the prestige is you, the end user. What they do is make you come back every single time. So how do they trick your brain to do this? 
I want to tell you about a thing called a habit cycle, a concept by James Clear in the book Atomic Habit. If you haven't read it, it's a great read. To form long lasting habits, whether it's good or bad, there are a few different stages. The very first stage is the cue. For example, if you leave work and you're walking home, you smell some donuts, that is your cue. The second stage is the craving. As soon as you smell the donuts, your hunger and your urge to get the donuts kicks in. Third stage is your response. Immediately you're looking for the donut shop. Where is it? I want to go buy it. And you go and get the donuts you need. <laughs> And the very final stage is your reward. Once you've had the donuts and you've devoured it and destroyed the whole box, your reward is the dopamine hit right up here that just kicks in. And the more you do that habit, finishing work, smelling donuts, going to eat them, the more the neural pathways build. So that next time, even though you haven't smelt the donuts, as soon as you finish work, your first thought is, I've got to go buy those donuts. Now let's travel back in time to Russia. It's 1897 and this guy called Ivan Pavlov, he's basically the poster child of every psychology class. Rightly so. He's got this incredible bushy beard. I could never grow that. He noticed that every time you bring food to dogs, they would start to salivate and eventually he would start to ring a bell every time he brought the food out. The dogs then associated the bell with the food and even if you don't bring out the food, they would still salivate with the bell. He showed that you could trick the brain by having a response like salivating and linking it with something like a neutral stimulus like the bell. So it's Friday afternoon and you've had a tough week. You probably know what you're going to do and you're probably salivating at the thought of doing it. Although you feel you're going to save money or it's going to be convenient, deep-rooted behavioral pathways are being laid down so that later on they don't have to reel you in with an offer. All they can do is send you a notification like and you're hooked back in. So that's not that simple, but I hope you get the point. So anybody can fall into that trap, even as a busy doctor, I'm there myself at times. Over the last two years, we're trying to balance out busy working lives, busy lives at home. We've got a little one that's 18 months old, so trying to do meal plans and preps is difficult and cooking can be a challenge sometimes. Looking back at things recently, we saw that we had a reliance on these food delivery apps, and it's actually one of the reasons I made this video. We're making an unhealthy relationship with food and our lifestyle because of these apps. And I hope the information I present to you will help you kick that habit too. But first, let's look at some sneaky tactics that they use to keep you hooked. So these apps have superpowers. The very first one is, you know when you get an app or a new thing, the immediately when they ask, do you want to turn on notifications? I think about 95% of people will say no to it. Well, not on these apps, you see, Everybody wants to know where their food is as soon as they've ordered it. It's like true. So one of the tricks these apps use is they link that tracking system with notifications. So this opens a channel for them to try and hack your brain. You see, remember we talked about the cue being the donut smell? In this scenario, with their deals, their notifications, the buzz in your pocket, the cue becomes your phone notification. And what that does is it triggers your craving. And what do you do after you've got a craving? You open the app and you order more. And this is why it can be so difficult to kick it out because it uses the same pathways as addiction. So you pick up the app to order a burger just before you reach checkout. Huh, I guess you better get sweet potato fries. And once you get to the checkout, look at that. It'd be wrong not to get the milkshake. It just makes financial sense, doesn't it? And before you know it, you've actually doubled your calorie intake because of these things called suggestive marketing. Because these apps have razor thin profit margins, sometimes they're making losses. Their aim is to try and change your behavior, to buy as much as you can so that every time you come into the app, you do the same again and again. Remember, these guys haven't got your health in mind. They haven't got your back pocket in mind. Their aim is to maximize profits. And to make it very clear, people have sat down in rooms with behavioral psychologists to see how they can sell you more junk food that you don't want. Look, I know these aren't mind boggling new tactics. E-commerce websites have been using it for years. Social media companies use it to get your eyes hooked onto your phones. And now food delivery companies are using it for you to buy again and again from their apps. The problem is that these apps are filled to the brim with junk food. 
A study in Australia looked at 13,000 different menu items on one of these apps across something like 200 different takeaways. They found that 80% of the food on there is junk food, so nutritionally unhealthy, high calorie foods. A further digital marketing study found that 70% of what's advertised on Instagram by these apps are all completely junk food because junk food sells. So this with more young people using the apps and low income groups, this means in a world where we've got a high cost for food and fruit and raw ingredients, more and more people are turning to junk food because it's more appealing and easily accessible. And when you're trying to survive, it becomes less about is what I'm eating super healthy and more about can I put food on the table for my family? I remember when my family came to the UK from Afghanistan in 96, my parents worked two jobs and they would get home late at night. They would get this like really generic, greasy pizza from like Pizza Go Go or Pizza Now, whatever. The box was just like, the, the pizza was swimming in oil. But I can't deny that it just tasted great and the dopamine hits of like family time, greasy pizza was just hitting all the right reward centers. Junk food can also be comfort food at a time of confusion, at a time of stress. And boy, have we had enough of those recently with the pandemic, with lockdowns, with war, with inflation and high costs. I'm worried a new generation of people are gonna be making unhealthy relationships with food. It gets to the stage where we have to ask whose responsibility is it? Is it us, the end user? Is it the government who should be doing something? Or is it the app companies themselves? Honestly, I don't know. I've tried to show you the link between these apps and an unhealthy lifestyle that they drive. Do we need to take some responsibility ourselves for our day-to-day -day choices? Absolutely. This channel is created for people who want to make lifestyle changes, day-to-day -day healthy habits, but it's not always that easy but it can also be quite difficult based on people's life circumstances. It's not just a switch you can turn on and off. What more can the government do? Well, in 2018 in the UK, they introduced something called a sugar tax for fizzy drinks. Basically, the companies that were making these sugary drinks had to make sure they had, didn't have too much sugar in there or they would get taxed more. The year after the tax came in, for each household in the UK, sugar consumption dropped by 10%. Not because they were buying less sugary drinks, they were still buying the same amount. But these companies, to maximize profits, put more, less sugar in to fit the tax criteria. I think it's a really smart idea to incentivize companies to make sure they are more responsible. I think something like a junk food tax should be going on. The money you take from that can be pumped into a country's healthcare system. For example, in the UK, it's something like six billion a year that the NHS is spending. That's crazy. And the thought that really worries me is what would have happened back in the day, in the tobacco heyday, if there was an app that would get you tobacco at your doorstep within minutes? How many more millions of people would have died? We need the same watershed moment for obesity. It's linked with 13 different types of cancers, heart disease, diabetes, stroke. It is a big killer in our society. And yet, if we do nothing, we are putting millions of people at risk. The obesity epidemic has been raging for years and I think these food delivery apps can be the fuel that really ignites the fire. If you feel that you're using these apps too much, if it's having a bad impact on your physical health, finances or mental health, I'd like you to do something with me right now. Get your phone, unlock it, head over to the app that you use the most and simply delete it. And of course, now you know about the emails that they'll send you to hook you back into a habit loop. Make sure you put that in the spam folder so they just keep bouncing. Thank you for watching, friends. Let me know in the comments what your experience of using these apps has been and whose responsibility is it in the end. If you would like to see more videos like this, please hit the like, subscribe, and bell. As always, I've been Dr. Khaled. Have a lovely day and peace out.